Hello, I'm everyone, ready. and welcome to today's webinar, Diamond in the Rough, Transition Your Land for Development, presented by ALC's Ben Crosby, Norma Nisbet, and Bob Turner. My name is Amanda Jenkins, and I will be your host today. I work as the Education Manager here at the Realtors Land Institute, and I'm really excited to be a part of today's session. The Realtors Land Institute, the voice of land, strives to maintain its status as the acknowledged leader for all matters pertaining to the land real estate profession. RLI endeavors remain the essential membership organization for the extraordinary real estate professionals who broker, lease, sell, develop, and manage our most precious resource, the land. We're here to provide our members the expertise, networking, and valuable resources that are the foundation for all land real estate professionals to become the best in the business. Today's webinar will help you recognize the highest and best use for the transition of a property, discover different techniques for identifying that highest and best use, and estimate a property's market value and identify the target market audience. We love to hear from you during today's presentation. You are welcome to leave any comments or questions in the chat box for Ben, Bob, or Norma, and we will answer them at the end of today's session. Please indicate which presenter the question is for, and we'll have those answered at the end of today's session. Now let me introduce our speakers. Ben Crosby is an ALC and CCIM and has over 35 years of experience in land and commercial real estate throughout the U.S. Many of his clients held land that transi transitioned to other commercial uses. He holds license from California to Florida, allowing him to facilitate projects across the nation. He is an approved RLI instructor for teaching Land 101, site selection, ag land market marketing and brokerage, and land investment analysis. He was also selected by his peers as the 2014 Land Realtor of America. Norma Nisbet, ALC and CCIM, has been a commercial investment brokerage specialist for over 25 years. Norma has specialized in land sales, development, site acquisition for multiple types of retail, residential, industrial, and commercial uses. Transactions have included sales, leases, and 1031 exchanges that have served the clients of Vista Properties Investments, the firm established and owned by Norma Nisbet. Norma served as the 20, 2004 National President of RLI. And lastly, Bob Turner, ALC has over 35 years of experience in latent real estate. He's been involved in acquiring, design, zoning of numerous tracts of development land for over the last 15 years as an agent, partner, and developer of residential and commercial properties. Bob served as the 2016 RLI National President and was the Memphis Area Association of Realtors Commercial Council President in 2014. For those of you just joining, welcome to today's session Diamond in the Rough, Transitioning Your Land for Development, presented by Ben Crosby, Norman Nisbet, and Bob Turner. And now Norma will cover today's presentation's goals. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's presentation Amanda, I don't have that screen up. There you go. Okay. Good afternoon again. Today's presentation will be defining transitional land. We will help you and show you how to identify your diamond in the rough. To talk about exactly what you are looking for, determining the market and value, and identifying your target market. Everyone, could you please mute your phones if you called in via the phone? We have some background noise. Can you do that in your bedroom? Please tell me you can't hear us. Yes, we can, whoever just spoke. Sorry. Ben? 
Hello? Yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm here. Okay, transitional land, first thing you need to do is understand the definition of it, what we're talking about today. It's when internal or external conditions change the highest and best use of a land parcel from its current use to either a higher or lower value use. Okay, and today the, uh, we're going to talk to you about five different case studies that we're going to review. We're going to look at uh, a mixed-use development in Memphis that Bob will talk to you about. Uh, I will be talking to you about an agricultural transition project in Eastman, Georgia, an industrial transition uh, project in Lakeland, Florida, and then uh, Norma will be talking about two Missouri projects, both a farmland to industrial and a commercial transition project. And without further ado, I'll introduce Bob Turner to you to talk to you about his Memphis mixed-use projects. Thanks, Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, Parkside at Shelby Farms in Memphis, Tennessee. That's our first diamond in the rough. It's a mixed-use plan development it's in the heart of Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, the vicinity map will show you a red outlined property that's literally in the geographic center of Memphis. And then the it's an all-vacant land. The only thing on it was one existing old home. It was zoned for residential single family for 282 houses. If we built those houses, the 282 houses, the total value of that would be $43 million. The tax revenue on that would be 686000 annually. So we decided there was a better way to do this development because the land, the house sales in that area we're averaging 100 to 120 thousand dollars. You'd have to develop the lots at about 43 thousand dollars. So the numbers wouldn't work from a single-family development, and the economics wouldn't work good on it either. So we designed a new plan. The new plan included five to six-story multi-use buildings, being apartments, retail, hotel, uh, service amenities that overlook Shelby Farms Park. And then we had four-story buildings, three-story buildings, two-story buildings, but it was all apartments and retail and hotel. We've got somebody in the group here that's got a, there a lot of noise in the background that may be interfering with everybody. Can you please check your mute phone, mute your phone. Somebody's got some kids, something playing in the background. Okay, so I'm going to keep going here. All right, so we designed the new plan that uh, went through Land Use Control Board. The process is different in every county and every city across the United States, but ours is through the Land Use Control Board of Chevy County and City of Memphis. You have to go through a process of laying out what you want to do, go through all the zoning regulations, decide, decide what you can do. And also part of that is meeting with the neighbors to understand what they're willing to go along with, what they're going to fight you on, and what's the best thing to do. So we decided, decided for two reasons. What made this really worth doing was it sits beside a 4,500-acre park in the geographic center of Memphis, Tennessee. They just spent $75 million private money developing that park into a world-class park with uh, a lake where you can uh, do rowing a boat and... and Person, all kinds of paddle boats and everything on it, walking trails, zip lines, music venue, restaurant, um, all kinds of uh, things they did out there right in, in the heart of town for a world-class park. Our property overlooks that park. It's literally 100 foot in elevation from our property to the other side of the park, so you can see all the way across the park from standing on the ground at our property. So that what that and the green line you've heard of you may have heard of rails to trails across the country where they take old railroad lines and convert those into 
bike trails and walking trails through the older parts of the town so it becomes a uh, ac- active way of life. Well, our frontage is the green line. We have over 3,000 feet of frontage. And uh, so it overlooks that. That's what made this really come about. Otherwise, this would not have happened. So we go to our conditions and what we got approved for. Um, and we got all, we asked for hotel, apartments, very intense zoning. And we went from 282 houses to we got zoning for basically 1,500 apartments, a hotel, and about 50,000 square foot of retail. And that took us about six months to get that approved. And um, once we got that approved, then we closed on purchasing the land. We bought it from six landowners, so we had to assemble the land and put it all together. And we're fully approved with conditions being conditions being that we have to put in some red lights, we've got to do some road improvements. We've got certain conditions that we have to do, but that's part of any zone. So then we went into our design. We spent about six months designing the buildings that we wanted, and the pictures that you're looking at, we've got four buildings across the front that face the green line, which is the little white line along the street that runs for 10 miles through town. And the park is the other side of the road. The intersection you're seeing there in the road, we're going to build that also. The Chevy Farms Parkway has been designed for 35 years and has never had the money to build it or really a good reason to build it. Now that they've improved the park and we've put our development together, that road is definitely needed as a regional road for traffic to come through the park and go north to I-40. So if you're looking at the corner building, that's going to be the hotel is on the front right corner. The rest of it's going to be apartments wrapped around a garage in the back. The first floor of the front building is overlooking a major patio, if you want to call it that, that has a, um, a venue of uh, music stay, uh, so that you can sit out and have concerts. You've got pop-up kiosk retail. You've got a water feature. It's a gathering area to sit out and look across the park. 130-room hotel. It will be 296 apartments in the first two buildings. I know that's the And the other buildings are the same way. They're wrapped around parking garages with apartments on them all the way across the front. And then as you go back north, uh, kind of an L shape, you get into four story buildings, some townhouse buildings, three story apartments. We're going to end up with 1,500 apartments, 50,000 square foot of restaurants and retail, and uh, all parking garages and roads and everything. It's going to be about a $375 million development. The road, the, the sweetest part of this deal is we can do a TIF, a tax increment financing district, where it takes the existing tax $10,000 a year and raises them up to eight million dollars a year in taxes you use the difference in those increments and you do a bond issue and you get to pay for the infrastructure being your roads sewer water electric parking garages all that's paid for by future taxes so we issue bonds to get that money the developer, the, the developer does not have to pay that back the, the taxes the future taxes pay that back so that's how it's all put together and developed. And you can see the pictures that we've got there. You can kind of run through those. That's, that's the main entrance. That's the front of the hotel and the apartments with the uh, gathering area out front. And uh, it's it's basically a place you want to go eat, hang out, watch sunsets, drink a glass of wine. We've got a restaurant on top of the building so you can watch sunsets. And uh, it's, it's going to be the largest residential mixed-use project in Memphis. And we should be beginning coming out of the ground about June, July of this year. And so the development process, let's kind of get into the details. Once you get your land under option or under contract, we don't like to buy ours until we know we've got what we only we have. So we design the proposed layout for the property. That's kind of a sketch. It's not what you see the pictures of. It's a sketch. You meet with the zoning and planning board. Discuss what you need to do, get your feedback, and you move to the next step. You 
file for the zoning for the land use, the land use control board. Then you've got many meetings with neighbors. We're going to talk to them first so you know what your opposition is. You've got lawmakers that make decisions on it, designers, engineers, architects, city officials, multiple, multiple meetings, especially on a project this size, to go through the development process. Once the zoning is approved by the city council and the zoning board and everything, then that's when your work really starts. Um, you've got design, everything like that. The next level of approval is city council and mayor and board of aldermen. They're the final say that says, okay, we see what you got. You got your zoning, you got your neighbors. We'll approve your development. It took us about a year to get all that done. Then you start on your final design. The pictures you're seeing here, we spent about four months going through all different designs from five-story, six-story, three-story, uh, layouts of apartments, hotels, everything like that. Uh, we, end, we probably spent about $300,000 just doing design work on the infrastructure, streets, buildings, with engineers, trying to get it all laid out where it would fit in the right place. So there's a lot of work. Then you file for that final site plan, which is what you're seeing now with the administration again, and, and they approve your final site plan that says, here's what we're going to build. And you, it has to go through all the city things. So you receive all the approvals from administration, you get your building permit to start, and moving dirt, and you go to work. So where we are right now is we've got, we're at that last stage. We're going through the approvals for the TIF, we're going through the approvals for the administration, we're getting ready to draw our final building plans to start building about July. So that's your development process. So the, now the economic numbers. This is where it really gets good. So we started out with um, 55 acres. We added seven houses to it. So we got 60 acres because we've got the road frontage now. And that could go from go to 282 houses, but it goes from that to 1,500 apartments, 130 room hotel, and 50,000 square feet of retail space. So you got a higher density. The tax base goes from 10,000, what it was zoned at houses, to the tax base for the development. I'm showing six and a half million. Now we know it's about eight million. So that number's changed. I need to update those numbers, but it's about eight million now annually. The land value, we paid $5.5 million for the land. The value with the entitlements and all now is worth about $22 million. Then the final property value goes from the land value to over $300 million when it's built out. And that's when everything you see on that picture is built out. So that's how the economics work. The tax increment financing district is, if you don't know about it, you should look into it. It's one of the best economic development things. It takes the future taxes, it pays for public infrastructure and private infrastructure as long as the public gets use of it, on-site and off-site. It's similar to a pilot, but it's better. It's a five-year startup, so it's a twenty. It's called a 20-year TIF. The five-year startup is where you fund the money up front on some of the infrastructure you're doing, and then the bonds are issued after you get a building up in there and it goes on the tax roll, so there's taxes being collected. That's when they issue the bonds to the people that buy them, and that's when the money comes back to you. So it goes from 10000 to $8 million a year. We're actually going to do a $120 million TIF. The city sells the bonds for the, for the TIF, and the developer does not pay it back. The taxes pay it back. So we're going to get to use $67 million in our development for building our garages, the streets, the sewer, electric, water, anything that's public-private usage can be paid for by the TIF. You can't use it to build your buildings, but you can use it to build garages, roads, infrastructure, sewer, drainage, things like that. It's really a good deal. And that's our uh, parks out at Chevy Farms. Ben, it's your turn. All right. Thanks, Bob. All right, let's uh, move a little bit to the southeast from uh, the Memphis area down to the big town of Eastman, Georgia, to talk to you about an agricultural transition uh, project that I was involved in. Uh, next slide, please, Amanda. Uh, first thing, just to give you an idea of where we are, uh, Eastman, Georgia, you can see it's uh, about an hour southeast of Macon, and Savannah, Georgia is off to the east about 
an hour and a half. Uh, this project uh, starts out, uh, we call it the Four Ponds Farms Project. This is October 2012, the existing conditions when I bought the property with a partner. The property was 379 acres, of which 200 acres of it was in a non-irrigated or dry farm condition, and there were about 179 acres of timber on the tract. Uh, weeds had grown up everywhere. The dry, the actual improved farmland had not um, uh, been farmed, I guess, for about two years. Uh, soil fertility was poor, and there was erosion all over this farm. So from there, uh, this is what the farm looks like right now. At the bottom of your screen, that is the south. So the property, it's almost three-quarters of a mile wide and a mile from north to south, and you, you'll notice the lightly colored areas. That is where the existing dry farm was. Um, the other, the timber is obvious, is obvious to you also. So, okay, we made that purchase, and then June of 2013, we began the project. We sold the timber off, sold it for enough cash, actually sold, got that cash the week after it closed, and started clearing off the trees, the stumps, roots, uh, clearing the weeds, all of this stuff. We got all of that removed, and the idea was we were going to convert that also to uh, farmland. We we built and repaired drainage ditches. Uh, we had, because there's a lot of elevation change on this farm, we had to construct terraces to slow up erosion problems. And uh, we repaired certainly the existing erosion that was there. We drilled two deep wells on the property, equipped them, and we did a complete irrigation design for the property to uh, maximize the amount of uh, land we could actually irrigate. We ended up, we put about uh, five different pivots on this piece of property and with the uh, drainage ditches and things that were there, we had to build, I don't remember the number, but a number of bridges across ditches to let these pivots cross over all this land. We spent a lot of time with soil amendments to improve fertility, and especially when you take soil, uh, timber off uh, in southeast Georgia, your pH is down around a 4.2 or 4.3, and you're looking for something closer to a 7. So we had a lot of work to do to get the pH up to make it uh, an efficient farm. Uh, we put cover crops out over the land to reduce wind erosion and the ditch areas and things, we planted those in Bermuda and other grasses to stabilize the land. Okay, next. All right, so now you're looking at a picture of the land after we had cleaned it all. Those dark green spots that you're looking at, there actually are four, note the name, but four ponds on this farm that we do use uh, actually two of them for supplemental irrigation if we ever lose a well or something. Next slide, Amanda. In December 13, we had installed all five irrigation systems. We uh, connected all of There's one small unit that we use some diesel out of a pond for emergency. Everything else is electric powered on this farm. And uh, in one small tract of about 11 acres, there's actually three freestanding volume gun systems that are giant uh, rainbird sprinklers, if you please. And all of this irrigation is run by uh, computer, it's mechanically uh, synchronized. Uh, it's just a very efficient system that we can run these units without people standing there all day. 
And again, as I discussed, we have a, a backup irrigation system in case we lose a well or something like that. And this is important. Ben, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Go ahead. Um, everyone, there's a really bad echo, making it hard for everyone to hear the presentation. Again, if you could please mute your phone or mute your computer, that would help eliminate the sound. So please take a second to look and see if you have your computer volume up, your microphone on, or if you're called the computer, make sure you mute yourself. Thank you so much. Ben, I'm sorry. Please continue. Okay. Go ahead and go to the next slide. You're looking at a, a diagram now of the irrigation design as we did that. You can see that most of the land is uh, covered by the irrigation system. Ended up with about 310 acres that are irrigated. And you can go to that next slide, please. Yes. This is just when Farm Service Agency came in and redid all the farm tracks for their purposes. That's what that looked like. You can go ahead and go to the next slide, Amanda. Uh, so May, we're at May 14 at this point. Uh, new soil tests were taken. We had uh, sufficient fertility in the uh, uh, pine timber areas. We were able to go ahead and plant. We stuck our, our spring crop in the ground and began. That first year, we had a combination of some peanuts that we put actually in some of the timber area because they do pretty well in low pH soil. We had cotton out there, and as you can see, we had some sunflowers. Go ahead on to the next one, Amanda. So the economic numbers look like this. We, we purchased this property for $605,000, and uh, we put 532,000 of improvements in it, so we had a million one thirty-seven in the property. The property about six months ago was appraised at a million five fifty six, which we feel very good about considering the low commodity, uh, low price commodity world we've been in the last few years. We think we've done real well with that. So cotton production in 2011, this farm harvested about $127,000 worth of cotton. In 2016, it harvested about $374,000 worth of cotton. And in 2000, uh, actually that was 2013, it says 17, but the farm produced $107,000 worth of peanuts. And in 2017, it generated about $328,000. So, uh, that was the purpose of us improving the farm the way we did, and uh, we're very pleased with that. So next slide, Amanda. Uh, is there a slide missing there, Amanda? Can you go back? Uh, thought I had put... Uh, no, okay. All right. Mr. All right. That's uh, all for that. Let's move on to the industrial transition in Lakeland, Florida. I wanted to talk to you about uh, this is, uh, oh, about 45 minutes from where our main office is. The map you're looking at shows uh, what we call the I-4 corridor that runs between Tampa and Daytona Beach. Uh, Lakeland is just about halfway between Tampa and Orlando. And that's where this project takes place. It actually fronts on Interstate 4. In 2010, this project or this property was about 90 acres. It had a 60-year-old citrus processing plant on it that actually was constructed by Kraft Foods in the late uh, 50s, and they ran that plant into, I think it was the middle 1990s before the plant was closed. And there were a couple of owners after them that tried to make it succeed, and, and they had failed. So the picture you're looking at right now 
is one we had to pull from some archives, an aerial photograph. This was a picture of the facility in 2010. You'll see Interstate 4 at the top. Interstate 4 has about 130,000, excuse me, 130,000 cars a day passing by. So it's very high visibility. And you can see a number of old buildings. You can see the retention ponds in the southeast corner. Those ponds, of course, drained all kinds of citrus waste and affluent. Uh, there was a, all the buildings, there was a lot of metal buildings that were rusted, and the plant was just in very tough looking Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, there we go. This is an aerial today of what the property looks like. You can see it has a whole different look to it, including if you look at the bottom that uh, retention area. This is a a higher look to it to show you uh, where this. Well, this shows the outline of the property before development. Go ahead to the next slide, Amanda. And now this is what it looks like today. You can see it. Uh, the front of it is fully developed. There is extra. Uh, there is available land for additional development, and the drainage system has been cleaned up. And I'm going to the next slide, please. So by 2016. The property had been converted to 875,000 square feet of manufacturing and distribution warehouse space. The assessed value at the time was $40 million. And there's 60 additional acres of land which uh, they have not uh, started any additional development yet, but it's there and available. Now, what had to happen, of course, is all those old buildings were demolished. Uh, a complete re-engineering of the entire site had to have been done uh, before the 875,000 square feet could be constructed on site. And, and we did want to show you that when this project started in 2010, the valuation of the property was $9.9 million versus where uh, it sets today at about $40 million. So a great project for uh, the Lakeland area and Polk County. And uh, go on to the next slide, Amanda, and I think you'll see something else. What you're looking at, if you can envision all these 100 plus thousand cars a day driving by that plant in 2010 with it just being a giant rust bucket out there. This is a front of one building. You can look at very uh, favorably uh, eye appeal here compared to what was there. Go ahead and scroll to the next one, Amanda. This is just uh, from the west side looking to the east. You can see how Excellent landscaping. Next slide, please. And just another view of another corner of the project. Uh, you can see Pepsi is one of the main tenants there. They do bottling in there. Uh, there's a very large craft beer uh, 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 house in there where they are, uh, I forget how many different uh, varieties of beer they're uh, manufacturing in there, but very popular with the local folks. Next slide, please. I think, yeah, I'm sorry, that's it for me. So, Norma, you're up. Good afternoon, this is Norma. Can everyone hear me, I hope? Well, thank you. 
want to start and talk about this particular project, and we actually did have the farmland, and we took it to industrial. This is in Peasley, Missouri. Next slide. This is the hay field that we took from the hay field and actually to the corporate headquarters. This was a few years ago. I had received a call uh, from a, a client of mine that I had worked with previously, Jim, and he called to tell me that he was calling on behalf of his father. They own the Midwest Motorcycle Manufacturing and Distribution business and company, and that his father was looking for a site for a business park because they needed to expand. His father was very disappointed in the current agents that he was working with. They weren't bringing him what he was looking for. You see, Jim Sr. did not want to pay $3 or $5 a square foot for an industrial site when he wanted to have his own park and develop it himself. So that's all he was hearing. So with that, I was assigned to work with the president of the construction company that was going to build their facility, and John and I would tour properties both in Jefferson County and Missouri where they were located. We also toured over in Illinois on the other side in Monroe County and spoke with economic development people there because they had some ideal sites that we thought could work if we could get them purchased at the right price, but if they would have the amenities. In other words, the key words were water and sewer that we would need for this type of a project. So with that, we continued working on it, and that whole process was about 18 months, you know, taking, taking the, having the meetings, taking rides, touring sites, and just didn't find anything that worked. I kept working on it. And finally decided, you know, concentrate back to Jefferson County to ride, ride and drive the roads to look for the uh, right locations. Finally, I did come across um, some farm property. Highway Z ran through it. And I was fortunate enough that um, uh, it looked like the majority of the property of the farmer had was on the north side of the of the road. The remaining portion he had on the other side and was doing some minor farming on it. Anyway, so I called up Jim and I said, hey, come down, meet me, take a look at this before I go any further and see what you think. So they met me and they said, yes, this should work. So with that, then I approached the farmer and he was not inclined to sell. He was strong-willed, as was my seller. So through that process, we finally got the property under contract, and that was actually first base, so to speak, on this project, because it was not in the city itself. We needed to annex. You want to move on, Amanda? We needed to annex. It needed a zoning change, and obviously then the most important thing was the infrastructure because if we didn't go through that process and know that we could get the infrastructure, it, the, the deal wasn't going to happen. So with all of that, next slide. Okay, you see the site there detailed. This is Peavely. And this is approximately the 28 to 30 acre site that I found. I'm pointing to Highway Z, which fronted the site. The majority of the farmer's land is on the other north side of the property. So this was the 28 to 30 acre site. To the rear of the site, we also had an added plus, Burlington Northern Railroad. So there's rail located here, which again for distribution and industrial use is ideal. With that, Let's go to the next slide. This is the aerial photo showing the other important features to, for an industrial site. The interstate is, is I-55. You have the Peavely Highway Z exit here, which had a lot of development and retail and fast food, et cetera, on the interchange. This site is exactly one mile from the interstate to our location. With that, that was just the beginning. From there, we had to really work at this and work with the city administrator because number one was to annex the property in the city. And that's where we probably got the biggest break of all because 
The uh, administrator was also working with Burlington Northern on our behalf and on the seller's behalf because they needed to vacate an easement to the rear of that property. When he was working with that, he found a, a, a location in, to the rear of the property where our site did join the city property. So, therefore, we were able to do a friendly annexation, which was uh, a lot different than the typical annexation where you must contact each of the property owners in between your property and, and the city, get approvals and in order to be annexed into the city. This was key to our receiving the infrastructure, the water and sewer that needed to be pulled along Highway Z out to that site. So with that, that was a big hurdle that we accomplished and probably really helped save this deal than we did make it. This, you are looking at an aerial view of the building on site because eventually, once we got there, this was a 130,000 square foot office warehouse distribution center on this site. But along with that, we still had to go through some of the other process. We hadn't completed all of the zoning as yet. So we went through the zoning process, the engineering, the plans, the architectural design was all submitted. And actually, zoning went fairly smoothly. We thought we were really doing well at that point until DNR came uh, calling on our door. And they decided that before we could complete the project, that it would be signed or sealed, that they needed to approve it to see if there were any Indian artifacts, and we had to do an archaeological survey meaning if they had found anything along the highway area where we were going to pull the water and sewer lines to the site, that would have mixed the whole deal. So as it turns out, we made it through that and achieved that, and finally we closed on the property. Next slide. And here you see the 130,000-square-foot facility headquarters to Midwest Motorcycle. They distribute and they manufacture in Mexico, but they distribute the after, after parts for Harley Davidson. Next slide. The economics of the deal. The original value of the land as farm property was approximately five to 8,000 per acre. We purchased the price uh, of the land when we purchased it was 32000 an acre. And you can see this made my seller very happy. But at the same time, my buyer was happy as well because there is nowhere that he could have found the land for that price to build his first building in the industrial park that he wanted to build. So there's no way he would have found that for 32000 you know, anywhere. It was the work and the efforts and working with economic development, and that is a key component in this particular transaction. The key meaning this company had 65 jobs. Any economic developer wants you in their area when you bring in jobs to the area. They were planning on expanding in the next three years at that time to about 90 jobs. So with that, both the city and the county were pleased to have this development. That's something to remember when you are out there and you're working with businesses or uh, with industry. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, somebody broke in there. Anyway, when you're working with business and industries, this is something to remember. Find out the, their employment base because that's what all economic developers are looking for. But the, val the additional value added to this project was also now the infrastructure in is in place for the future development. You have adjoining properties that they have had an increase in their value because now you have the water and sewer lines running through or on their properties along the highway. And again, you're in the path of progress and waiting for development. And the next project, uh, we Yep, okay, this is Richardson Crossing. This uh, was a um, listing that I got, and it was already zoned commercial, ready for de development, or so I thought, and seemed like it would be a slam dunk. 
But as it turned out, it, it really wasn't because in looking at the site right now, and you're looking at the screen, look at the one corner section at Richardson Road and St. John's Crossing. If you can see that, you will note that that was not part of this property. The farmer owned it. He was still farming it as a mini farm in this development area of 10.4 acres. And the unique part of it was that, yes, it was zoned commercial, but we had limited frontage along Richardson Road because of the allowing of that corner to have been developed. It wasn't owned by the farmer. There was no master plan from the city, so it just happened at random. Little did we know the impact that it would have on attempting to market and develop this site. Next, next slide. So you've heard part of the story at this point. Uh, it was owned by a farmer. He still had it as a mini farm. It was zoned commercial. As I said, I thought this would be a slam dunk. But what we found was, again, there was limited frontage. The corner section had been previously sold, so that limited both the visibility, the frontage, and the development potential from that other corner when you wanted to have a good mixed-use commercial development. In listing and working with the property, my seller would not divide the property. I had lost many offers and deals when they came to us and wanted to do an acre, two acre site, or either fast food, auto zone, whatever the case might be. Because at that time, we had strong, there was really strong traffic counts. It was over 22,000 traffic counts. So it was highly trafficked. It's an ideal retail location. Another problem that we had with the property was the grade elevation, and I will show you that later in one of the other slides. But the grade elevation on the north side of Richardson, this was 8 to 10 feet higher than it was than street level. So many of my users or potential developers came to the site and they said, well, you know, we're going to have to spend too much to excavate, to cut, cut the dirt down and to bring it down to street level. So they walked, and actually they would go to the south side of the street, as did some of the retail users, and buy on the other side when they can get the smaller sites. The other issue was the lot size. And while 10.4 acres sounds like a great development site, and it can be, when you are looking for retail users, and if you're looking for standalone big box users, it's too, too small. They want a minimum of 16 to 20 acres. So with that, I lost the deals to any Lowe's, Home Depot, Kohl's, Best Buy. It just wasn't going to work. Finally, in this process, we had a gentleman, a developer come forth. He presented a plan. We took it to the city, uh, went to our first hearing, and this was for a multifamily use, which was a downgrade in zoning. So we really didn't think we had problems, but the first hearing at the zoning meeting was really very contentious. They were really opposing it. This was a gated community with pool, clubhouse, etc. They really opposed it. Went back, had made some changes second time around to the zoning hearing, and even my elderly owners went because they just couldn't believe it. But long story short, it was uglier than the first time, and it was really, it almost became mean and vicious. So quite frankly, that developer walked and said, that's enough of this. Through that process, we did adjust the price, but actually, over the years, our price was under market compared to other properties that were commercial zoned for retail in the area. But that was always an issue that came up when they felt that a developer coming to the site would have to put the extra work into it. This was a lengthy process over three or four years working on this project. Then finally, I did have a developer I had worked with previously on some Walgreens deals, and he came to the table. We had an agreement. We put it under contract, and he was going to keep it as commercial and do a mixed-use commercial development and continue on. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that's one of the other slides maybe was out of place. But anyway, uh, the commercial developer, we finally closed. We purchased it, and I had already began working with him prior to closing 
to sell off some of the outlots on the front parcel. So by the time we closed, a month or two after that, we closed on two additional parcels. So now let's move on, and we will see the next slide. Okay, this is the aerial outline of the development. You see the culvers, and the rear of the property is a 40,000, 140,000 retail mixed-use development. You still see that we did not have that corner and the difference that that would have made originally if we had had that corner for this site. Next slide. And again, this is the ground that was during the clearing process and grading process for building. You see the close proximity to I-55, Richardson Road along the front, and the site locations marked out for those outlots. And this is the pylon with all of the current tenants on site. Look, if you will notice below, I said I would note the, uh, oh, can we go back real quick? Um, in that one shot with the culvers, that shows the eight to 10 foot grade elevation because the shot was taken from street level. So that was one of the issues that we had to contend with. But all in all, this is the site with the Culver's, the Regents Bank on the front out lots, and then the mixed-use developments. The economics of the deal, we had 10.4 acres. We sold it for 2.2 million or 458 a square foot. The Culver site sold for 13 a square foot. The Regents Bank, 17. And the retail center leases between $14 to $20 per square foot, and those are triple net lease numbers. Next. Okay. So what is your diamond in the rough? Ben, Bob, and I have put together some examples of potential transitional projects that might be suited to you, to your area that you may find. This is loading slow for some reason, but anyway. Closed manufacturing plants, vacant shopping centers or malls, and we happen to have three of those in our area currently. These malls are going to be in for total redevelopment. Blighted or boarded downtown buildings, vacant hospital buildings, railroad rights of way unused, vacant military facilities, vacant government buildings, vacant waterfront buildings in disrepair, brownfields, and ag land that's in the path of development. We also have put together some unique repositioned, redeveloped properties that are in our areas that we wanted to share. I have one here. This is the De Pair Quarry in St. Louis. This demographic and zip code is the highest uh, value zip code, both salary and property value-wise, in our area. In 1994, this 180-foot rock quarry, totally vacant and probably had a negative value, was purchased by a construction development company. In 2014, this is the photo of it when it was completed with 6,250,000 cubic yards of clean fill. And actually that's when they sold it and now it is a mixed use development. And the economics are phenomenal on this project. After the site work and fill work was completed, the entire site, they sold it for 7.2 million, or 590 a square foot. The hotel site sold for 2.6 million, the office site sold for 1.6 million. The apartment site sold for 6.3. And assisted living sold for two. It was just in the business journal this past quarter, last quarter of 2017, the apartment developer sold that project for 55 to 65 million. Quite a value. And this is the, you're looking at the, um, assisted living as you see the rest of the development on the video. 
That's the hotel and then office building. Next. This is some background history and economics on a very unique project. It began as a 20-acre apple orchard in the 1880s when purchased by Johann Bussen. It has now expanded to over 600 acres of working quarry, barge terminal, rail terminal, and underground storage. The rock and stone in this is over 350 million years old. We're concentrating now on the Bussen underground And keep your eye on that first shot with the blue awning over the entrance to the office. What you see, these are entry areas into the underground storage that is warehousing, office, and distribution. So the one on the left with the blue awning, as I said, keep your eye on that when we go through some of the other shots. Then we have the entry and showing the underground the other office entry, and then we have the trucks that are loading going through the streets and the parking areas underground. Next. Tractor trailer unloading and parking their trailers at the docks. Parking as they're leaving the and, and driving as they're leaving going down the street area. You'll notice the lights at the top of the ceiling. This is the entry to one of the offices underground. This is a 20-foot high ceiling industrial warehouse storage facility with, and you see the dock doors for loading and unloading for distribution. The bus and underground is 40 acres of a million square feet underground and includes streets and parking. 109, they have 119,000 square feet yet undeveloped, but the current developed space is at full capacity. They are leasing this between four and ten dollars per square foot, depending on the de uh, denominations of office versus warehouse. The land value range would be 125 to 150,000 per acre. This is the full working quarry that adjoins the river and the barge line. It's currently in effect now and working. This is the outside parking for Bussin Underground. And as I told you before, to look for that little blue building awning, you should see it over to the right of the photo there behind the uh, over-the-road trailers that are parked over there. So that is the entry to their office into their warehouse area. <coughs> and with thanks. that, we're going to Memphis. Yep, thanks, Norma. Um, our diamond in the rough that we show off in Memphis. Um, years ago, we built a pyramid in Memphis for a sports arena that the uh, Memphis Tigers played in and um, um, some other teams played in there. I think we had some professional games in there. But it was never finished out on the inside to be completed as what it was. And then the Tigers moved to the new FedEx Forum. So we had a vacant pyramid in Memphis for about 12 years. We sold that or basically gave that Bass Pro Shops, and it is now the largest Bass Pro Shop in the country. It is 34 stories high, and everybody thought it would never work, and it is unbelievable. They have uh, boats inside, they have ducks inside, fish, they have bowling alley, they have a 33-story straight-up metal elevator beam going to that top point up there where there's a restaurant, and those are balconies looking out over it. The first month, it had over a million visitors through there. And even today, it's just packed all the time. It is, it is an unbelievable, it has a 100-room hotel inside, everything you could want to buy, shooting range, archery range, uh, museums, everything in there. It is a destination place. So 
uh, it sat there for a long time, but now it's one of the icons in Memphis. So uh, it uh, is really something to see. So if you ever get to Memphis, you want to come see that. And it's got great views overlooking downtown and overlooking the uh, Mississippi River, our bridge, our M Bridge, as we call it, lights up at night. So uh, that's what we have in Memphis. So that. Ben's going to tell you about, the, about what they have in Florida. Okay, thanks, Bob. Uh, Miss Amanda, are you having some issues there? I am. My PowerPoint just froze, everyone, so I apologize. <laughs> But just stick with it for okay. a second. Um, while I we're waiting, think... Bob, we had a question earlier about um, somebody was asking about the TIF. If the, do they apply for the TIF with the city directly? You apply. It depends on how you're set up. Uh, ours is set up. We have an economic development. Uh, it's called the Edge Board. And you apply with them, and they approve it. And then usually the city or the county uh, we have a city government and a county government, and both of them have to approve it because you've got taxes. depends on where the property actually sits. If it sits in the city, then you've got county and city approval. If it's just in the county, you just have county approval. But there's some process that uh, you'll go through some board or some government entity you'll go through for them to approve the TIF. Okay. Yeah, somebody just asked if that project would have been developed without the TIF. It could have been. It would would not work as well because the road really makes it better because we have the only corner that will ever be on that road just because everything else is developed for the hotel and the development. But it could have worked without it, and we are approved without it. But um, the the TIF makes it that much better. It's sixty seven million dollars worth of free money. That's one thing that makes it better. Great. And everyone, I again, I apologize. Just experience a technical difficulty here with our PowerPoint. But we'll get started in just about thirty seconds again. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Are there any other questions about anything else that's been uh, presented today? Yeah, this would be a great time if anyone has additional questions. Um, we can go ahead and get those answered while we get the screen back up and sharing. Okay. If there are no other questions, I would just uh, just kind of okay. We got it up and running. Okay. As we get going here, we're getting ready to talk about what we think might is the largest transitional land project uh, in the country, and uh, wonder if you might have some ideas what that might be. Well, here we go. So what, what, do you, what do you think is the largest land transition program? And there's a picture. Anybody need help with what that is? Uh, as, as a uh, born and raised Florida native, this has uh, been kind of amazing to me. I, I think there may have been uh, a million or two million people in Florida when I was born, and today that number is almost 21 million. And a lot of it had to do with these people here from California when they came in. Go ahead to the next slide, Amanda. Um, what happened here was that sometime in the middle to late 60s, Walt Disney sent some people undercover. They formed two or three shell companies, and they came to an area in central Florida, and they started uh, working independently with unsuspecting brokers and ascend, assembling ranch land and ultimately put together about 22,000 acres of land. Now, what you're looking at in this picture, if any of you have flown to Orlando before, 
you probably noticed that your baggage tag did not say O-R-L for Orlando. It said M-C-O. And if you look up there at McCoy Air Force Base, that's 1969. And at the time, that was just an old World War II military base with some Quonset huts, and there was one runway up there. You can just see it a little bit. And I will tell you, as late as I think it was 1981, when I had moved from the Tampa area up north of the Orlando area, and I had to fly commercially, believe it or not, I flew out of McCoy Air Force Base, and the terminal that I went into to get in the airplane was an old Quonset hut. And so that was the early 80s. And, of course, uh, Disney had opened in 70. And what you're looking at, this is from the west, uh, probably about 10-plus miles or so, looking due east out towards McCoy Air Force Base. And you will notice there's virtually nothing there. And look at Sand Lake Road on the left, that little path, which will go all the way out to the Air Force Base. That today, most of the way from Interstate 4, which is about seven or eight miles, that, I can't even tell you how dense that is. But uh, just keep that picture in mind. Go ahead to the next uh, slide, Amanda. This is the same area today. Uh, first of all, McCoy Air Force Base is just uh, in the dust bin of history. There are now four parallel runways uh, Orlando had something like 36 million passengers go through it last year. Uh, and that is a number, I think Orlando is now about the fourth or fifth or sixth largest airport in the country. It's way up there. And part of that is because from 1970, when almost nobody came to Florida, to last year, over 120 million tourists came to Florida. That's one-third of the entire United States was here, if you just want to think about that. So this picture gives you a flavor of the density that exists today just in this one area. Go ahead to the next slide, Amanda. This that you're looking at, if you look at that road going from east and west, 1969, interstate Four had only been completed for a little bit more than a year, very little traffic, and of course it was almost 100% uh, pasture land. Next picture, please. This is the Walt Disney area today, and uh, they still have some land left, but much of their 22,000 acres is developed. They have added some land, but uh, if you've been in this area, you know how dense the traffic is, and uh, it's just it's an incredible scene. It's been nonstop development, basically, since about 1968 through this whole uh, time, even in recession times. Uh, this area has ex been experiencing uh, growth. Go ahead, Amanda, to the next slide. And this is just another view. You can see Interstate 4 now. Uh, you're looking at Epcot up at the top left. That's the Magic Kingdom up there. Uh, the new Disney Springs, you know, that was um, what they call that downtown Disney that was tore up and totally redeveloped a couple of years ago. Uh, just incredible density throughout this whole area. Long ago, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, uh, the Orlando metropolitan area uh, far surpassed uh, the Las Vegas area. Uh, Las Vegas, for many, many years, had more hotel rooms than any city in the United States, and, and Orlando blew by them like they're standing still. And still, I mean, I can't begin to tell you how many hotels are under construction today, but it's uh, quite phenomenal. So uh, here's here's interesting story for you. 1969 demographics, Orange County, where uh, most of Disney sits, and Osceola County, which is the adjacent county on the west and south, total population was 287,000 people. In 2016, 
those same two counties, it was 2,387,000 people. So just a phenomenal growth. Uh, I have seen numbers, I can tell you in 2017, more than 50,000 people moved permanently into the Orlando area. And to give you a sense of what that means, if you have two and a half people per home, which is about the average in Florida, that means we had to build about 12,000 units just last year to accommodate that growth. In Osceola County alone, in the last 90 days, 1,260 kids have enrolled in school. Uh, most of them are from Puerto Rico, moving up here from Hurricane Irma. So uh, this area, if we didn't already have phenomenal growth, <coughs> 400,000 people move in in 2017. That number will be much, much higher this year because our growth has been accelerating, plus the Hurricane Irma damage is bringing a lot of people here. So uh, that is our story. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm going to kind of wrap it up here for us, and um, y'all send your questions in. Uh, answered a couple of them online here, but... Uh, let's talk about why we use an ALC. I hope most of you on the call are ALCs, and if you're not, this will uh, give you a reason to become one. ALCs are experts on all matters pertaining to land transactions, whether it's developments like we've talked about, or rock quarries, or or changing farms, or turning in commercial. They're, it, it trains you for all that. The experience that in our group, within the RLI group and the ALC group, is very extensive. There's very few people you can't pick up the phone and call and say, I need help with this, and they'll help you because they've, they've done a lot of transactions to be able to get to the point where they know where they, what they're doing and why they're doing it and how it's to be done and can explain it to you and will help you do that. So experience, expertise and experience are, are great things. <clears throat> Knowledgeable. Once again, the knowledge that we train in our education courses is second to none. You can go take these classes, and you literally walk out the door, and you can use them that day on a transaction you're talking to somebody about, and you're knowledgeable enough to sit down and walk them through how you can help them. Our network, it's, I got in this back in the 90s, and I have so many friends across the country that I can pick up the phone and call. I did this morning. I talked to two different people this morning. I talked to Michael Landreth yesterday. Colorado past president hadn't talked to him in six or eight months and you know you just call and network with some of the best people you ever gotten to know in the business so it's unbelievable and they help you they they send you referrals they call you for information it's an unbelievable network so it's just great ethics I tell a story uh, one day I was sitting in a meeting with the uh, president of NAR and the and the vice president and the president elect of NAR and we were talking about ethics and what we do and, and how it relates to the Realtor Association and they wanted to know what our process was and I said well we all kind of looked at each other and I said we pick up the phone and call somebody and tell them you're screwing up, straighten up and we just don't do that and that's pretty much the way it is in our group we don't we do not do anything unethical, we do things right we, we teach people how to do things right and that's our reputation is we do everything in an honorable, truthful fashion so that's what's great about ALCs. So are there any questions from anybody, any comments, anything, please send them in. I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. Thank you all. Thank you again, Bob, Norma, and Ben. Um, like Bob said, we're going to open it up for questions now and comments at the time. You can type your questions in the chat box in the name of the presenter you would like to direct your questions to. If it's for all three, state that, and each presenter will take time to answer it. Um, so I'll go ahead and facilitate those questions. I'll read them out loud so everyone can hear. Um, so we had from Casey Mock, and he said, great job. And he said, can you speak to structuring feasibility periods on these types of deals? This has been a, this has a, been a steep learning curve for me, and without a good partner experience, it would have left a lot of exposure. Well, you're, you speak to structuring feasibility periods of these type of deals? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and y'all can follow in behind me. The feasibility part of it, you, you, it's a lot of work depending on what you're going to do. On our deal, we had to deal with apartments, retail, and hotel. So you had to figure out what your feasibility was for the three of them and put them together. You've got to estimate the numbers of the cost, what you're estimating for the infrastructure and everything else to go with it. So there's a lot of guesswork on the front end, but you've got to have pretty good guesses to get close. So you've really got to spend a lot of time working through spreadsheets. And if you don't know it, you've got to find an expert to know it. We created a team of about 15 experts on our deal in Memphis that went from engineering to financing to everything. So you've really got to have good team players and good partners in it. That's the way I would say. Ben and Norma, y'all want to comment? Well, this is Norma. I would totally agree with that. Uh, you've got to have the right team players, and that's what they are. They are your team. They are your experts. I would also state in the situations that I have mentioned and been in with, uh, especially the one with the manufacturing plant, keep in mind that was working with economic development with the county. That was working with the city administrator and economic development. And truthfully, when you have projects like that, they can become your best advocate and really help you uh, smooth the way, get through the process of the deal. Not that it's fun. It, it, it's a lengthy process many times. But in order to get through it, you need those professionals and you need to have them on your side and also any outside expertise, the engineers, the architects. Uh, they're, they're the ones who can give you the information and verify to the governing entities, you know, the project that you're doing. Ben, you got comments? Yeah, I was just going to say it's just really the same uh, process in agricultural type deals. Also, time periods might be a little bit shorter, but the the knowledgeable uh, members of your team will have everything to do with your success. Uh, if you're a little bit inexperienced, or you're not sure, you still need those same engineers. You uh, can consult with people from the Farm Service Agency, uh, Department of U.S. Department of Agriculture. They have people available that can help you with different things in your state, wherever you are. Your the land grant university in that state has a Department of Agriculture that they have people that'll come out, look at a site with you, and help you figure out uh, what the soil situation is, what might grow well and not. Uh, how available is water, wetlands issues, all of these things can be found out and make your life a lot easier if you've got a good professional team working with you on the project. That's right. I'd add one more thing is those experts that you're talking about, they could be another developer in town that you can trust. You can go sit down with them and ask them to share numbers and share what they've done on different projects. And we did that with ours. I've never developed apartments, never owned apartments, done many other things. But I went to the guys that have been done a lot of it and sat down and went through cost and numbers just to understand it. So it's not just hiring somebody. It can be somebody you know that you can go sit down with, that you can trust, and they'll give you the numbers. Exactly right. Good yeah, point. exactly. They're willing to share. That's right. Great. Great. Casey said thank oh. you. And he said, I would say bringing the best team of partners possible has been our best decision on our development projects. They were expensive but worth it. That's good. That's right. Exactly right, Casey. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, another person said, the ALC that has been speaking on the commercial development and the TIF, can I get his email address? Bob, can we share that information? <laughs> sure. B. Turner at southernprop.net. That is short for Southern Properties. So it's S-O-U-T-H-E-R-N-P-R-O-P.net. I'll put it on here on the chat so you'll have it. There's another question on my screen. Do you see that, Amanda? Yeah. Yep. Um, on a project that it could take – that it could be one to two years before payday, do you ask for a consulting fee during the process? Great question. Sure, if you can get by with it. You don't, you don't want to work for free all the time. You better protect yourself. So 
if you can get a fee that could be credited on the back end is one way of doing it, but you definitely want to be compensated for your knowledge and experience and time. Agreed. You can't always get it, but I would suggest that you, you try. And at the same time, I also think that's something that we as ALCs need to address and really work more toward determining how you can establish yourself as a consultant and get paid as a consultant on an hourly or, or some form of salary basis as opposed to straight commission. I think we all give away too much time and too much energy and information. Yeah, well, you get enough experience, you learn not to do things for free all the time. <laughs> Great. Um, well, are there any other questions? If not, the three ALCs who presented today, um, they can be found on the Find a Land Consultant tool, and you, you, you're welcome to reach out to them if you have additional questions um, or you just want to chat and get some advice from them. They are true experts in the field. But I just want to say thank you again. Thank you again, Ben, Bob, and Norma. Thank you to the participants and for your patience during our technical difficulties today. Um, a recording of the webinar and the PowerPoint will be sent out to you via email in the next few days. But thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate you guys being here today. Everyone have a wonderful thanks. day. Thank you thanks for putting it together, Amanda. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks Amanda. Amanda. Bye, everybody. You're welcome. Goodbye. <laughs>